Welcome to the Intern Whisperer Best of 2020 Part 3. The first episode in this compilation is going to be the future of podcasting. I would love to like to wake up to a podcast. I don't know what I'd choose though. What would you choose as like your wake up podcast? Mm, something that would have a lot of energy because sometimes I may not, I get up really early and so I don't always want to get up. So it'd have to be something with like, I don't know, a bugle blowing or something like that. I'm gonna have to find some because normally the things that I listen to are talk. They're not necessarily, um, they don't necessarily have a lot of noise in them. So they would like music. They would tend to make me want to just stay in bed and listen. I don't know if I would wake up with it. That is so true. If I if I had a podcast to wake me up, I would just want to listen to the entire thing before waking up. <laughs> yeah, I just stay in bed. Why? Why get up? I feel like I would choose something news related just because I don't watch the news that much anymore now that we're allowed to go outside. <laughs> But I, yeah, I, I would have to choose something news related. Uh, but we're, we're talking about technology that isn't there yet, unfortunately. And although we're not quite there, we're moving toward a world where you can listen to any podcast you want, whenever you want, on whichever device that you want. And as a result, creators will likely start thinking about the impact of these different formats. So we asked a few more people on the streets uh, what their favorite genre of podcast is. So let's tune in and see. Podcasts about TV shows. <laughs> I'd say like business is probably my domain um, in terms of the types of content I like to listen to. Comedy ones are always fun as well to listen to just for fun. Some of my friends really like like the mystery ones or like the scary story ones. I think those are cool, like that tell a story. But I also like the ones where people just talk and like exchange their opinions and have like a conversation about something that's going on. Well, that was really interesting to hear what other people like to listen to, because there is also comedy and people don't think about that as a, another form of a podcast. But maybe you want your hour long marketing podcast to be live on Spotify, but you also want to cut it down into several quick tips using those types of podcasts that can be easily digested through your Google Home device, through your Google Home device. These are the kinds of questions that future creators will likely be asking themselves as podcasting technology advances. Now, podcasts are embraced by the masses for a variety of purposes, including education, entertainment, and even background noise. And celebrities have also accepted podcasting with open arms. The list includes Anna Ferris, Conan, Alec Baldwin, Joe Rogan. Oh my gosh, I've been listening to Joe Rogan since we had had our conversation with Andrew Weiss. And I'm going to tell you, I really like Joe Rogan. And then there's Will Ferrell. And just this month, former First Lady Michelle Obama announced that she will be hosting a podcast on Spotify earlier this month. And the first episode just dropped last week. Her first guest is none other than her husband, and former President Barack Obama. If nothing else has proven to you that podcasting is expanding to tremendous lengths because we've been spitting a lot of facts at you, let's try to put it into more of a perspective. Podcast Movement, which is the largest annual industry conference, was founded in 2014 and in 2019, just last year, over 2,000 were in attendance. Another podcasting event, PodFest Multimedia Expo, founded by Chris Kremitzos, who you have heard throughout this episode, was held virtually in August and broke the Guinness World Records largest attendance for a virtual podcasting conference. That was a little bit of a mouthful <laughs> with over 5,000 attending the event. And Isabella, you were a speaker at this event. Tell us about it. I that. was. Oh my gosh, it was amazing. I just, I could not believe how many people were engaged. There were community rooms where people were having conversations and networking was, was crazy. And then there was also all of these, it took two weeks to do this whole conference. And Chris is a master. He and his team are a master at putting on these kind of events because that is a lot of people to move around, whether it was over 300 something speakers, and then there was over 5,000 that attended. It was an amazing thing. 
So let's hear a little bit more from Chris about what his take is about this upcoming or this previous event. Uh, we're doing an online summit uh, called the uh, PodFest Global Summit, and we're going for a Guinness World Record. We're looking to set the record for largest virtual event over a week's time in the niche of podcasting. We're on our way. We're about 25% of the way there. We're hoping to um, really get 90 to 100% of the way there by the end of uh, the first week of August. And uh, the, the record attempt starts August 10th to the 15th. All and right. you, can, you can find us at podfestexpo.com. There's free tickets as well as premium tickets. In 2019, a new Edison report indicated that more than half of Americans listen to podcasts. So keep in mind, this was happening in less than two decades. And that's so hard to believe because I don't know how old you are, Anne, but that could be less than your lifetime or a little bit more than, you know, I'm not exactly sure, but nonetheless, podcasts, it seems like they've been around for a long time, but really not so much. Yeah, I agree. And I've been alive for two decades. <laughs> All right. So you're as old as podcasting then. Yeah. <laughs> so how about COVID-19 and all of its impact on podcasting? So let's hear from Q. Uh, he's the station manager over there at Valencia College about what he thinks uh, about COVID-19 and its impact on the podcasting industry. With COVID, COVID was honestly one of the best things to happen to podcasting and streaming and everything like that, because since everybody's stuck at home, you know, traditional radio is mainly listened to in your car and uh -huh. you're not in your car. Most people don't have the app to listen to that radio. And so since the world has kind of gone to this on demand at home listening thing, mm -hmm. it's thrust podcasting and any other on demand service into the limelight. So I can see in two years, actually, um, act, the next year podcasting just being major, um, Spotify buying out more people, right. iTunes buying out more people and shows and um, maybe producing some form of a network or something like that, but they still have to remain on demand. But I see more people getting big contracts, kind of like the music industry for podcasting because um, revenue, these these streaming platforms they're getting revenue but they want to see how to maximize revenue and if podcasting is becoming bigger and at the forefront because everybody's listening on demand they're going to try to sign or get exclusive rights with these people um you got youtube doing it spotify is doing it itunes is twitch. doing which is twitch is definitely doing it so um, and I think Facebook's going to get in the game soon. One of the interesting trends from COVID has been that in the U.S., podcasting audiences have declined, partly due to the uh, fact that people are no longer commuting for you know two or three hours a day. However, mm -hmm. globally, podcasting audiences are on the uh, way up, right? And in Europe, for instance, they've gone up in some places by 50 percent. The interesting area where they've gone up is education and um, so-called hobbies, you know, things to self-improvement. And mm -hmm. I think that is, as you say, uh, a way because you can both consume and interact. So it, it, it becomes a way of delivering as well as testing for information. It uh, becomes an incredibly useful tool and people can do it in snack sized bites, right? They can do 15 minutes here, go back, do another 15 minutes, do it on the exercise bike, do it in the kitchen, do it whilst they're gardening. It becomes um, a private yet and um, a non-intrusive medium of uh, consumption. Wow, uh, that is a crazy perspective. I, I really liked hearing that. And we are seeing new podcasts about the new normal and more people talking about it on just about every single show. I mean, it's the only thing that you really can talk about. There's a pandemic that is affecting everyone. So of course, everyone's gonna be talking about it. Stephen Smike, Senior Vice President of Podcast and Influencer Marketing at audio advertising company Baritone One, said it's too early to tell how fewer people are commuting and stagnant in certain types of industries and how it will affect podcasting overall. He said, but early on, the largest hosting companies that are responsible for hosting lots and lots of podcasts are saying overall traffic is up and listeners are up. Well, I, yeah, I agree with that just because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> People yeah. are to go out. So they're going to 
stay in and listen to content. Mm -hmm. And they're even going out for walks. That's the only way we can escape the house. After all, it has been six months since we've been having to live within a quarantine type of a lifestyle. And podcasting has just done amazingly well. So much like Trump during the impeachment hearings way back, the news agencies have started creating event-specific podcasts. NPR has its Coronavirus Daily podcast, which gives updates just about every 10 minutes when it was at the peak of, the, of what was going on. And then the upcoming home cooking will help you whip up quarantine meals. So there's a podcast called Epidemic, and it brings analysis from Dr. Celine Grounder and former Ebola response coordinator Robert Klein, the number of shows that are popping up is just amazing, said Smee. But what does the future of podcasting look like? Artificial intelligence jumps into the picture. We all have heard the acronym AI, and it has the potential to affect every aspect of podcast creation, delivery, and consumption. Consider these applications. One of the hardest parts of hosting a regular podcast is coming up with fresh ideas. You know this, Isabella, you have your own podcast. And coming up with fresh ideas that will appeal to your audience is even harder. Machine learning tools like HubSpot's content strategy tool can help creators discover themes that are popular with their listeners and people like them. Uh, so you use HubSpot. So how do, have you used these strategy tools? I haven't. And that was one of the things that I found so interesting when we were doing the research on this particular topic. And so it definitely is something that I'm going to be implementing into our podcast moving forward. Gotcha. So if you can personalize the ad experience on podcasts. That is probably not much different than what we're experiencing when you go and you look, click on something on a website or you're in your social feeds and then all of a sudden Pizza Hut pops up because you just clicked on a Pizza Hut ad <laughs> or maybe it was Nike shoes and then all of a sudden you get just deluged with Nike advertisements. Well, that's what's going on here. So if you listen to a lot of podcasts on the same network, you'll probably hear the same few ads over and over again. And remember, there was this little incident that happened with MailChimp. It was a running joke during the first season of Serial. So we went and we asked people again on the streets, what are their feelings about ads and how do they break up the viewing of whether it's videos or podcasts? Because podcasts are also blogging, they're out there. Let's hear what these people had to share with us. I don't think it's um, like, it's not as intrusive as kind of like a video playing ad because mm -hmm. usually the good guys will kind of segue into it like as if it's a talking point. And they're really good at it. And I, I always listen to them. I'm like, God, that, that was a good segue. So, um, and they'll, they'll segue into it and talk about it for a minute and then just go right back to what they're doing. And if they just, if people listen to them religiously and they keep doing stuff like that, then um, maybe people are more inclined to buy the product. So I see advertising coming in more in that form. Well, I mean, it just really takes me back to being a kid when, we didn't have Netflix and all that stuff and you just watch TV with commercials. And at the time, like that was fine to me. I was 10, whatever. But now that I'm so used to like Hulu premium or whatever, Netflix, it is like annoying. But then, I don't know. I feel like those people that put the ads out, they gotta make money. They gotta get their customer base up. So I don't really get to, annoyed about it because I know that there's someone behind that that's like I need to get paid <laughs> so I don't really I don't really get too mad especially because when I listen to podcasts on Spotify the ads aren't unskippable like on YouTube like I can just fast forward through them if I really wanted to the second episode in this compilation is us celebrating National Women Small Business Month I think that the, the thing that when people say, oh, I want to be my own boss, you put in more hours than you did in the job. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I um, retired my husband from corporate America. He was with Florida hospital systems for several, many, many years in the IT computer department. 
And it was a very, you know, it's very stressful. All these doctors' computers and Blackberries and all the technology that he's got to service and fix them. So I called him up and said, you can give your two week notice and draw your retirement. I have a job for you. I need you to run my company, which he does. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I sell and do the creative stuff. I don't do all the, the money, the financing, the book. I, I don't know what comes in. It's just like, hey, I need this. I got the money for it. It's like, yeah. So, and he's setting up a new studio, but yeah, I retired him and he's been with me for eight years. Um, it's, yeah, I, I, I want to create not just my life, but I created our life. Yeah, something that you you build together. That's wonderful. I love that. So I know this was hard work, but you know, did you ever feel like there was like, oh, forget it. I just want to put it, just put it to the side, scale it down, whatever. Did you ever feel that way? Yeah, we've talked about that many times. Like, okay, last night at 1.45 when I was still working in the morning and then my phone rang at 5.45. I'm like, okay, I said to my husband this morning, this very day, I am done. This is it. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you say that every day. No, um, I love, love, love what I do. Um, I mean, I'm very good at what I do. I do very creative copywriting and creative graphics and images and assets to distribute to the world visually. Um, but yeah, growing before, we have some people that work for us with us, some freelancers. We're both working 12, 14 hour days. Some days because of the real estate industry and the end of the month and open house and stuff, we still like, nobody can do what we need to do. So there's no giving our helper this to do they do the support work so we still have to we, we work long days we can travel when we want have computers we set up if we are in a hotel room or wherever we prepare that in advance we prepare the technology uh we can travel no you know uh so it's just it works well and then some days we just work eight hours and call it a day we do not work on sundays we work half day saturday and so we really have a good life the week gets a little bit hectic but there were a few times I said, let's just cancel all these clients, but these really big ones and keep them. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's like, he, he told me one day, he goes, Shelly, look at the finances. If I cut out all those clients you're talking about, and so that he goes, that portion of our company is 62,000 a year. Okay, we'll keep them. <laughs> yeah. um, and that was like a little quadrant of our quadrant and then we've got this group over here and this so yeah it's no it's good I love them all it's just sometimes we're, but we are we always plan for retirement we're always planning moving mm -hmm. to the day to sell the company keep up client we're, but we're always getting new clients so it we're in no way ready to stop we love what we do we love our clients so how do you think that men and women approach business differently? Because again, it's Women's National Women's Small Business Month. And I think that we do approach it very differently. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I have a very kind of maybe a different opinion of that because I actually sure. work with a man who runs my company, okay, and approaches my business. And that's probably our biggest um, point of discussion, okay? Like, um, okay, I appreciate what you're trying to say. Uh, however, at the end of the day, I run the company. <laughs> I mean, I've had to say that, okay? I mean, we're equal partners here, but at the end of the day, the final say so lays with me. So, um, because my approach is just different from his. Mine is more, I must serve. I must serve until I can't serve anymore with the best quality the kindness with the, I must serve my clients this way. Um, maybe I've, they spent tens of thousands of dollars sending me to Covey seminars when I was in corporate America. They've uh -huh. invested a lot of money in, with management in me. And those things are with me. They're part of my company. I brought them in. I must serve. I love serving people. Um, to get, I don't know, maybe women feel different about serving them. Men are like, let's do the job. Okay, the job's done. Check it off. I mean, they do care, but that heart and service spirit is like, okay, they're very methodic, very technical. It's done. Here's a list. But I think they're just it's that man woman thing that we have that more passion and stuff, and, and they're more get it done. 
here's here's how it goes. He's so good. He's so clear. He's so detailed. But it's that that the service thing. element. Yeah, it's that it's thing I have. Mm -hmm. And he told me because I got to tell you one thing. There's a few things that nobody will ever be able to do that you do. Nobody can communicate the way you communicate and nobody can design things the way you do. You'll never hire anyone to take your place because they won't do it. So how do you measure success for your business? So I don't measure success by money or income. I don't, I can look at the bottom line every month and that doesn't, you know, whether it's, you know, six figures, seven figures and whatever it is, I look at that and I always say, oh, well, there's room to grow that. Or I know a way I can grow that. And it's like, you don't have enough days and time in your day to grow that. You need to sleep because I am that person. I am type A. And if I, I can grow that, I just, I don't have to sleep, but I can grow that. I can take any element of business and I, know, and I can grow that. <laughs> I was going to say, no, you can't. But um, I think I measure it by A, value metrics. So with my clients, I have to prove to them, I send them reports. So success to me is if I'm managing your social accounts, I need value metrics to prove what I'm doing to you. If I can't prove what I'm doing for you and I have no analytics and I'm an analytics girl, then I'm not successful at doing what you need me to do to grow your business out there. So I would say that's kind of my number one. I'm very adamant, not only serving them, but making sure I have hard value metric analytics to back up what I say I can do for you. I can grow your business. I can get you buyers, sellers, leads, whatever. And I need to prove that number. The second way is by what I hear out there. <laughs> like, you know how Facebook is? It's kind of squirrely, but I'll be sitting there and my name will pop up and people say, I got tagged somewhere and I look up at the post and it says, yeah, I'm looking for a great social media marketer for my real estate. And somebody, I don't even know, says, oh, here she is. And they tag my name. I know that person. Um, it happens, I'm like, thank you, Beth, so much. I don't know Beth, <laughs> but that's okay. I, I was on a call before us, a guy, John, he goes, I watch you on social media all the time. I'm ready to grow my real estate business. Oh, and who are you? John, okay but they are watching. So I'm very careful, Ace, um, who I am on social media. Yes. Um, I don't post anything with no current events or current social injustices or controversies. There's no political things. There's no religious things. Although people know I'm a faith-based person because I've had to tell some people I don't do things like that, okay? So, um, so that's one way. Um, I, I measure success by these people and they'll send up like reviews. She's the best I've ever had. And I've paid for plenty of people, but I've never had it, you know, um, or she's so kind. It's that kindness thing that I get, um, you know, oh, we've had a few mistakes, but there's nobody that's going to go off the side of the bridge for you. Like Shelly will, she'll go over the deep end. So that to me is my, is how I measure success. That is really, I think that's the proper focus also. It's about giving, you're going back to the service element side of it and being able to measure the service. Um, that's their kindness that falls into servant leadership. So like you're, you're speaking my language and I already feel that connection. One thing, well, if I can just jot it in, I've never had a knock on wood, a bad review everywhere. When, if anybody ever wants to leave my company, I find out why. Most of the time it's because they can't afford it anymore. Or they're not, they're going out of business. But I always, I want them to leave with a love, a love. Great. And it's been a whole month. You know what? I'm just going to refund your whole month anyway, just so you feel good to start over. I'm going to give you extra assets and pictures all branded for a full month. When you leave, you're getting a parting gift from me. The next episode we have for you is our interview with Harold Gattaro. You said that you had studied marketing and it, it also obviously helped you get there. Uh, you have two businesses that you're running. You want to tell us a little bit more about where they're located, how people can find you, and, yeah. and then how is this COVID-19 impacting your business too? So it's kind of a, a multi-layered question. So feel free yeah. to do a little meandering. 
Okay, so yeah, so Vitality Bowls, um, Superfood Cafe, we have two locations um, and it is a franchise that started in Northern California. So we were the first ones to bring um, Vitality Bowls to Central Florida. And so we have one location in Dr. Phillips um, on the corner of Conroy, Windermere and Dr. Phillips, Phillips Boulevard. Um, that was our, our first location in Central Florida. And that's going on, our, our, we're gonna celebrate our two year anniversary next month. Um, Happy so, birthday. Uh, thank you. And then our second location, which we opened um, in November, is in Ocoee. And so that's on the corner of 50 in McGuire, um, uh, West Colonial in McGuire um, in Ocoee. And that's in a brand new shopping plaza. Um, and so we're, um, so far there's two, two uh, tenants there, our, ourselves and a dentist. And so um, we look forward to having some, some, some um, other neighbors in the near future, but that's our, um, our second location. So, um, wanted to make sure that we expanded so you know we have uh, a lot of customers that live in the Koei um, Winter Garden Windermere area that um, it was a little harder to get to Dr. Phillips on a regular basis so now they're able to uh, to get to our Koei location. Yeah Winter Garden and Koei are burgeoning growing development areas for some new housing so I would expect that you should have some pretty good growth as the development uh, continues out in that area. Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're located um, between, you know, uh, the Turnpike, 429, and then the 408 is, is within half a mile of our store. So it's a great location. And then the other question you asked is, you know, with the COVID-19 um, pandemic that's going on, we've, we, we definitely have seen a, a decrease in business and we've had to reduce our hours you know as, as well as a lot of other companies are you know are reduced hours or, or closed because of the situation um, so we were definitely impacted as well and so um, we reduced our hours um, we are offering curbside service um, you know we, we have a great loyalty app called vitality bowls and it allows the customer to order ahead through that app and pay and then you know they just make a note of what car they're driving and then we will deliver it to their car um, so we can limit the, the, the opportunities for people to come into the store and then also they can order online. And we also have um, delivery services that we use uh, such as you know the major ones, Uber, DoorDash and, and, and Grubhub that customers can order through and get it delivered to their homes. Um, and so we've, we've taken some other precautions within the store to make sure that you know we're creating as safe an environment as we can for our customers as well as our employees during mm. this time. That's really, really good. I know that Johnny is a fan of acai bowls. Uh, Love so, acai bowls. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure you'll see him at your store. I have right. two on my list already, the tropical blend and the dragon bowl. All right. The dragon bowl is amazing as well. So Make sure you download the Vitality Bowls app and we'll give you $3 off your first purchase for downloading that app in a free oh, bowl. Oh, nice. Yeah. Do you have to yeah. download from the app as well? I mean, order the bowl through the app? Uh, to get the $3 off? Yes. Uh, no, you can, you can use that on the app if you pay ahead or you could use that, that $3 off in the store if you, if you needed to come in. And what we're doing is if you come in to place your order, um, you know, you'll place your order and then we ask you to just, uh, we ask customers to just wait in their car and we'll just deliver it to their car just as an extra precaution so we don't have um, customers waiting in the store during this yeah, time. Yeah, that's a good idea. That really is. And I can certainly attest to how tasty this is because um, when I met Harold, it was at a recruiting event at Valencia College and I had mentioned to him <laughs> about the possibility of coming to the Good Network as a sponsor, and he so graciously did so. He brought plenty of samples there, and I was a big fan. I kept going back multiple times to get the samples, um, and we also had Tijuana Flats. They came in as a sponsor, and I met them at a recruiting event. So here they are. They're going to be guests on the show, and I could not be more appreciative of that fact, but uh, that's how we met. And that's how I got my first taste of it. And 
just like you were sharing, I noticed that it was um, it reminded me of a smoothie, but it was thicker, but not like yogurt, uh, not with that kind of a texture. But it was uh, somewhere in between. But it was scrumptious. I absolutely yeah, that's why I kept going me back. Of sherbet. Have you had sherbet before? Sorbet. Mm. Sherbet or sorbet? Sorbet. Well, well, the sherbet and so it's two different things, but same texture. Yeah, I like the sorbet. Um, sherbet, not as much. To me, they they taste different. But um, it was certainly tasty. It was it was thicker, I think, than a sorbet, though. Okay. Mm, I yeah. just love the toppings on top. I always get extra <laughs> coconut, extra granola, more honey, please. Yeah. Kind of yeah. I defeat the purpose of the <laughs> actual bowl, but <laughs> I like them a lot. Yeah, I, I'm totally with you on that. Um, so, here, yeah, I go ahead, John. Coming from the front of the house, and well, I mean, hospitality industry in general, I've been working in since I was 15 years old. What's your favorite part of owning a restaurant now? Well, yeah, as far as the, you know, the I'm I'm more of a front of a house uh, person, you know, in terms of you know I it, I, I enjoy um, meeting and greeting customers and and talking them talking to them about the menu and and providing you know and educating when possible in terms of um, some of our superfood ingredients and the benefits uh, of those. And, you know, I, I've been able to, to meet a lot of great people and, and, and know their names and, and, and know some of their, you know, what they like and what their favorite bowls are and favorite you know, smoothies are. So it is something that, that I definitely enjoy doing. And then, you know, being able to um, provide somebody with a, a, a healthy, a way to eat healthy, but not sacrifice taste. And, you know, a lot of times people, they think, well, oh, this is a healthy place. And they, they are very, they're pleasantly surprised of how delicious um, the bowls and smoothies and, and, and the food is. And so and, and a lot of times it's, it's hard for them to believe that there's no added sugars. Cause they're like, for some of the bowls, it's like, wow, it's, it, it tastes naturally sweet. Um, but it's, it, it, you know, it's, it, it tastes amazing. So it's a, a new, um, way for somebody to, to eat healthy, whether they just love to eat healthy or wanting to eat healthy, but didn't find the right healthy thing to eat. Mm. Babies can eat this, right? Absolutely. Yeah, because sometimes, yeah. you know, little ones can't have things like honey until they're over a year old, but I, yeah. I would think this is super healthy for babies. Yeah, and we also have a kid's menu as well, uh, which we have a kid's smoothie, we have a kid's bowl, uh, grilled cheese panini um so we it's it's great because then there is something that's um, that's available for the kids and the kids love it um we have some parents that bring their kids in and say you know don't don't tell them what they're eating and then you you'll will bring bring them their food and they're like hey here's your ice cream or you know and and so the the parents are telling the kids that it's something different but they know it's amazing or they'll sneak in and say hey, can you blend in some spinach into that? So they can get their spinach or their kale and not you don't even taste it. So it is um, a way that you can get a lot of nutrition, but you don't sacrifice taste for, for, for kids, adults, or anybody. Oh, that's super. That is really, really super. So I'm glad to hear that you're doing those extra precautions for your, your customers. Um, before our show started, one of the things that you shared with me is how you're giving back in the community. And I think this is awesome because honestly, um, many, pl many places are not recognizing the fact that, you know, people in the grocery stores, people like I was in Walmart yesterday and, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, oh my God, thank you for being here at Walmart so I can come in here and get something, right? So go ahead and share with our listeners what it is that you're doing to, to give back. Yeah, and so, um, you know, what we're doing, you know, really, because we're all about, um, you know, providing, you know, being part of our community and, 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 and doing whatever we can for our community, um, especially now, we, we started was a, a first responders healthcare um, support initiative in which um, we've done quite a few of deliveries, my wife and I, um, over the last couple of weeks, in which, you um, uh, one, there's like three different aspects of it. The one aspect of it is, 
you know, if a customer uh, purchases a, 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 a 14 ounce or 20 ounce smoothie for a first responder, we will match it. And so if 10 customers bought a smoothie each for first responders, um, we would add another 10 and then we would go to the fire station and deliver 20 smoothies um, to the fire, um, for the firemen and, and thank them for, for what they're doing. Um, we've gone to the police stations, we've gone to um, admin health. Um, and so that's one of the things that we do. And then another aspect of it is, you know, some, some, some of our customers are like, you know what, um, I want to do something else. You know, I want to provide a meal. Uh, for for um, a hospital or a doctor's office. And so then they would purchase food for them and then we will add in a smoothie. Um, and so with, you know, because we are, we're a superfood cafe and have amazing healthy um, food, you know, especially during the, this time and, you know, we have a lot of the you know, folks like whether they're at Walmart or at a hospital or, you know, police station, fire station, you know, they're out there, um, you know, every day so we can have, um, so we can do the things that we get what we need. And so with our smoothies, you know, we can add, we, we usually will add an immunity blend and multivitamin boost to it. So they're drinking something that tastes amazing, but it's also getting that additional nutrition that's going to help them as well. So this is something that, you know, I, I look forward to doing. Um, you know, we were, went to Advent Health. Um, yesterday and provided um, 64 lunches um, for an ICU, the pediatric ICU unit, and um, you know it was great to be able to 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 deliver that for them. And so, you know, our goal is to um, deliver at least 50 um, a day. Um, wow, that's a lot. That's serving a lot of people. That is wonderful. You must have some really great customers out there that uh, are as passionate about giving back too. Yes, it, absolutely. You know, um, one of the, the first customers that I, I went to um, was, he's, he's local, Brandon Seiler. He used to play um, for, for the NFL and, and for the Florida Gators. Um, and, you know, I went to him and, and told him what we wanted to do. And he said, you know, I want to definitely, I'm in. And, you know, he wrote us a check for, or gave us a thousand dollars and said, you know, let, let's go ahead and, and, and start delivering smoothies. And then he also had a couple of, um, of, of doctor's offices that he particularly wanted to provide lunch for. And so he kind of, so that's why it's like, you know, um, it, it's a way for, you know, and it was, he was, he, he loved the idea and he's just like, yeah, it's, it's an opportunity for me to help, um, you know, even though I, you know, I'm staying home, but then I can help, um, you in this cause in, in giving them something that's healthy and delicious. Oh, that is wonderful. That is really a good story to share. So I know that you had mentioned that you have two children and that you were seeing this as a family business. How do you bring your kids into this and to the business? I know your wife is a part of it and that's super awesome, but you had a job where you were having to travel all the time and now you've got some freedom and having a family-owned business, you know, is, is a way of keeping everybody together. Why don't you share with our listeners about that and how this is, I'm pretty sure, going to be a whole lot better than what you used to do. Pharmaceuticals yeah. is brutal. I know that. Yeah, you know, there was a lot of aspects of, of the pharmaceutical sales industry that I, I definitely enjoyed, you know, as a regional sales manager. It was, it was, there was a lot of it you know, the interaction with uh, my team, you know, helping develop, you know, um, people, and then also, you know, helping my customers meet their needs. Um, so there was a lot of benefits, but then there was some other things that, that were a little tough. Um, you know, it was a lot of travel. Um, you know, I was going to um, Orlando airport just about every week uh, to travel to a part of, of, of my, um, one of the five states that I covered. And it was, uh, it was a lot of uh, things within my, that I was missing, you know? So, you know, we, you know, I talked to my wife, we, you know, then we created a plan um, for, for, for us to be able to um, invest in ourselves and kind of work for ourselves and, and create something that, um, that, 
when it's time for my kids, if they wanted to um, be involved in it, that they could be. And so, yeah, now, even now, you know, I have 11 and eight year old and, you know, when they come into the store, of course, before um, uh, the COVID situation happened, because they haven't been in there since, but um, before that, they, they, they would help, you know, whether it was wiping down tables or bringing in the chairs after we closed. Um, and it's, you know, kind of instilling that sense of, you know, um, working, and um, they understand that this is a business um, that 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 is ours, um, and and they understand they love the bowls, so it's a way for them to eat healthy, and they're able to, if somebody talks about or asks a question about acai or um, pataya, which is dragon fruit, they can kind of talk about it. <laughs> so um, it, it is something that you know that they they have that you know. Um, that's gonna really help them in, in their future. The last episode we have lined up for this compilation is the future of beauty products. Enjoy. I was an undergrad at Cornell University. I studied economics and I picked economics because it kind of felt like the major where you get exposure to everything. I, I don't think I really knew exactly what I wanted to do 20 something years ago. I still don't know exactly what I want to do, but I certainly didn't know then, but I knew that I wanted to know enough to be dangerous enough to have, you know, a little information about a number of different things so that at least my first job out of undergrad, I could begin the journey of sort of getting towards what my passion or my purpose or whatever could look like. So I studied econ which I loved and, you know, stumbled into a finance career. And so when I graduated from Cornell, I had my first role out of business school, out of undergrad, sorry, was working at Goldman Sachs in New York. Um, and over a number of years have worked in finance uh, since then. And in between now and then, uh, three years after I graduated from Cornell, I went to Harvard Business School where I studied general management um, and then, you know, went back into finance. So, and I think just to put in context around, you know, my college experience in those days versus now, first of all, I don't know what it's like to be in school now, at least to be a college student, but I know, you know, when I was in college, I was really, really insecure and I wish that somebody told me oh, yeah. to chill out. <laughs> I wish that somebody told me it's going to be okay. It's kind yes. of like, I, I felt like you know, I don't come from a background of privilege. I was raised by a single mother. And so, you know, I had scholarships and work study and loans and, you know, all the stuff that most people do. And I was petrified of poverty. And so I, that guided a lot of my decisions while I was in college was what's the job that I can take? That will first of all, allow me to pay off these big old loans. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and, yes. And, yeah. And that will take me away from poverty, right? That was kind of right. my thing. It was like not, you know, the language of having passion in those days didn't exist. It was like, how do you pay the bills? Um, and how do you, you know, help your mom? And how do you help her to help your sister? And, and that was what I was thinking about. So it was a very different day where, you know, I see, you know, these really amazing college students who have these lofty ambitions to save the world and do different things and just do these really great things that, you know, I'm like, wow, I wish I didn't have to think about existential um, issues when I was, you know, in college, but, you know, be that as it may, I have no regrets. So yeah, my background is predominantly in finance, um, but I always knew that it was going to be a short-term career. Unfortunately, you know, short-term went into medium-term, went into long-term, and I just kept doing it. And I think, you know, about five years ago, I realized I was really, really unhappy with, with what I was doing as much as I had kind of grown in my career and climbed up the ladder. I just wasn't satisfied. I wasn't happy. I wasn't fulfilled. And so, you know, I decided to make a change. And, and part of that change was to find out what my passion was and what I felt my purpose was. And that led me to the business that I run now, which is called Bossy Cosmetics. And we, you know, our goal is to reimagine beauty, but focused on ambitious women. And so, you know, we often say that we ignite confidence in, in our customer who is a self-identifying ambitious woman through high quality co cosmetics, topical content, and, and really great services. 
Mm. So, so that's it. It's my journey of where, you know, what I just talked about and to where I am today and, and wanting to find a way to be a support to other women as they go through that journey as well. I remember when we were in NASDAQ's program uh, a year ago, it's so hard to believe it's a year ago. This whole 2020 felt like 10 years. I don't know about anyone else, but it has just dragged. <laughs> um, but it's really not been that, that bad, I guess, in perspective. Anyway, um, when we were in there, one of the things that I remember you, when you were introducing yourself, you said that you wanted to help women feel uh, powerful and that makeup was part of that because it actually, you know, boosts their confidence. It, it, it's a part of your, your, your look, your professionalism. And it just, you know, it's one of those things I really hadn't thought about. And I don't know if women think about that even now about how it can change how they see themselves. I'm kind of curious if you've seen because of COVID, I don't know if you know this or not, if there's been a spike in cosmetics, because I would think because we're all online, it's going to go one of two ways. Either women are spending more time, you know, making sure that they look good when they're on Zoom, or that they've embraced the fact that, okay, this is me. And here I am in my my less beautiful state or less made up self that you might see in the office. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? And it's yeah. Just- yeah. I think it's, it's more, it's a bit of a mix. It depends on your brand, your brand value, your brand ethos. Um, I think by and large, if you look at the prestige cosmetic space, which is the space that I'm in, um, cosmetic sales have been down. Really? Right. They have been down. But then if you look at certain segments within the beauty sector, that it has been up. And, and so what are the different differences between those? So I'll start on the on the side of what has gone up is when you think about how hard it is to go through this pandemic right now. So mm-hmm. let's I mean, you know, you have this so much economic malaise and instability. We've had basically a racial pandemic. We've had a you know, an economic pandemic, we've had all sorts of pandemics, right? Lots of things going on at once. Mm -hmm. And people have really embraced the notion of Mm self-care and, you know, just just wanting beauty and self-care and wellness in and of itself. So not because it is something to be consumed for somebody to, to gaze or to gawk at you, but because it makes you feel good. And if you remember when, when we first started our conversation, you know, you started off by saying, eh, not feeling so great today, but you put on lipstick and everything is good. Oh yeah. Right? So that's true. exactly, exactly. And that's what a lot of our customers said to me, like, you know, had a really crap day, put on this red lipstick. Cause I know I needed to show up for that zoom call and I needed to get the ball rolling. Right. So I think that for us, I mean, we're such a small business and we're so early stage that actually we have grown this year over last year. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that's because of our positioning and our values. Right. People are really changing why they're wearing makeup or how much makeup they're wearing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you when we when we say that we are a brand that's really leading with igniting confidence in women who are dealing with all sorts of different issues right now, that really People feel like they're they're seen, right? We do a lot of work where we, you know, a portion of our proceeds go to certain nonprofits that do social advocacy for women and girls. People love that, right? That's a values-driven decision because yes. ultimately, a really great red lipstick. You know, I believe red lipsticks are all different, but for most people, a red lipstick is a great red lipstick. But hey, if I can pay for a red lipstick with a company that's run by somebody I really admire, the values are are great, the ingredients are clean, the packaging is great, and I know that, you know, X percent of this is going to go to somebody who needs it, you know, that's a pretty easy conversation. It starts to feel like this virtuous cycle of, you know, you're indulging in something, but your indulgence is also helping other people. Yes, yes. So... It's, it's, you know, I think, and for, for me, I've never wanted to start a beauty company that just plops out beauty products all day, right? That's not very interesting to me. I wanted to really focus on the story and the, and the empowerment of women oh, I around love that. how they look and how they feel and what they do. 
And the business model is that we sell beauty products, but I really wanted to go deeper. And in fact, that has been, you know, the thing that I say is very distinguishing about us to any other cosmetics company is that we are very focused on the woman behind the face. Mm -hmm. So while we sell her products to put on her face, we are really focused on making sure what's behind that face is equally as amazing as what's in front of it. Do you have a certain uh, demographic that gravitates to you in, in age? Um, I'm always interested in that too, because many times I have friends that are in their fifties and they'll say, well, it feels like they've become invisible. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, as women, the focus is always on women in their twenties and their thirties. And it's like, no, I, I don't even, I'm not even seen anymore. And I find that really, um, discouraging, honestly, to hear. Yeah, yeah. I think, it, I think, look, our, my demographic, I always tell people, our demographic defies age, defies race, defies ethnicity, and defies you. You know, she literally just is ambitious. And what does that mean? She can be an investment banker, she can be a school teacher, she can be, you know, a, a, a home, a childcare provider, she can be a number of things, she just wants to do better for herself and for her life, right? But what we have found is that our customer is, is generally a working woman who is between the ages of, I would say, you know, 28 to 48. So a pretty broad range. But, you know, when we did our NASDAQ program last summer, I, or, or end of last year, I interviewed a bunch of customers that I had never met. And I did it Zoom calls just like this. And every time the camera came on, I was shocked by what I saw. You know, I was shocked by, you know, if I saw a woman's name, Maria in Wisconsin, I'm like, how did Maria in Wisconsin find out about me? or find out about mm -hmm. this brand? And then her face would come up and she's a 58 year old coach who was an accountant for many years. And she mm -hmm. saw us on a Facebook ad or something and she decided to try it out and she loves the product. So, you know, I, 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 I don't wanna put ourselves in a bucket of who we speak to. I, I, our bucket is that, you know, if you are ambitious, if you wanna do better than you were yesterday, if you are competing with the person you were yesterday and not with anybody else, you are my customer. What I love about that is what I'm hearing is it's about diversity. Oh yeah. Inclusion, which we know those are the words for this year besides COVID. Diversity and inclusion, because there are spans generations, it spans, you know, let's also point out sexual orientation for, you know, there are men that also want to be able to use beauty products. I know that you're yeah. women. However, there are men that will also say, I want to be able to use this. Usually it's the skincare side of it. Yeah. That is uh, really important also is that we remember that it's, it's really about what makes a person um, whole mm -hmm. and I think attractive. Absolutely. Uh, to themselves more than anything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, oftentimes people will say things to me and this is a red flag, like, you know, either a prospective investor or a so, so quote unquote advisor, a mentor, you know, will try to steer our marketing or pitch efforts to, you know, women wearing makeup for men. And mm -hmm. for me, that's a major red flag because, um, I mean, I'm married and I love that my husband finds me desirable, um, but I don't want that to be the reason why any woman makes a decision. Like I want her to make the decision because she wants to. So if right. she says, I want to be hot for this guy today or this woman or whoever, that's right. her, she owns that power. Or it could be, I just want to be hot for myself or I just feel like buying this, but I do not want to ever be in the business of telling another woman that she should buy my product so she can look sexy for yes. a man. Just, it, 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 it is always the red flag of, okay, this person doesn't understand what I'm trying to build. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because what I'm trying to build is all about the person in the mirror. I agree, I agree. Because anytime we do anything, we should always think, okay, I'm doing this for myself because I want to feel good about who I am. And that goes back to that question that, you know, women that reach 50, they're feeling invisible. And I've had a lot of women tell me that. And I sat there and I thought really hard about it. And I said this to somebody else. I was interviewing a prospective intern. And I said, this is the youngest you will ever be. 
you need to remember that. So instead of thinking of yourself as, oh my God, I'm so old. And some people in their thirties are going, oh, I'm so old. I'm going, really? You do not see how beautiful you are to somebody else on the outside. So, you know, beautiful skin, they'll think they didn't have any makeup on. I go, are you kidding? Look at your hair, look at this and this and this. Men, I think, come across and they seem to be a little bit more confident in how they pre present themselves. But women, um, we're very hard on ourselves. So I was having this yeah. with Robin yeah. earlier. I think mm -hmm. that if we were to treat ourselves like we do our friends, would we go and say, oh my God, you know, I look horrible. I wouldn't go and say that to anybody. So I need to make sure I talk to myself the same way. Um, yeah telling Robin it's about traveling light and that means just uh, listening to the so monkey chatter emotional baggage. emotional baggage that's right that's right but you had asked earlier about where I see the beauty industry going in five oh, years yeah. and you know I think that we will continue to see this growth in independently owned brands Yes. you know, that are really values driven around, you know, what the packaging is like, you know, the ingredients, they yes. will be very stories driven, right? It'll be, I am from this particular place on the planet, and we have this particular flower, and it's great for the pimple, and somebody will create a business around that. And it will be, you know, very much around people are going to want to really understand who's selling them the product. Who are they supporting? I think people are, are are increasingly becoming very mindful of where their money is being spent. I mean, you know, in June, you know, just kind of after, you know, the video of George Floyd's death came out, you know, the groundswell to support businesses that have been started by, you know, black owned entrepreneurs was unbelievable. And that was very much, again, stories driven around you know, just inequality and in access as a black owned founder. Um, and so it really told me that, you know, whether that's sustainable or not, people, you know, can be driven to care and increasingly will be driven to care about things. Um, and so, you know, if I think about in the next five years, you know, beauty slash cosmetics industry, you know, you'll see a lot more fragmentation. So it'll be less you know, the massive Max or Estee Lauders of the world, or they will have to buy these companies to remain relevant because us smaller brands, as I said, we will lead with a story. We'll, be, we'll have a stronger ability to create a community, communicate with that community, and we can be a lot more nimble in terms of making decisions um, that that is important to our customer base than a massive organization can. So that, I that's where I see. Change. I've done research on what that future looks like. So not only is it the packaging, it's about how that packaging should be disposed of. So it limits the footprint mm -hmm. of pollution that we have. Um, limit, of course, any type of testing on animals. So it's oh yeah, oh yeah, getting oh, away yeah. from things that are harm harming others. Yeah, absolutely. Others can be the planet and animals. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, are you mindful at all of like which ingredients you do put in your products? Like, is there anything in particular that you try to avoid or um, like substitute with like a more natural ingredient in terms of that? Uh, because it's like, you know, whatever we put on our skin, um, like it absorbs right, like straight into the body, like our liver doesn't detoxify it. So um, that's very important. It's like the ingredients that are in our products that we use. Absolutely. Um, I mean, absolutely. If you, I mean, we're very transparent with the ingredients that go into our products. Before we even launched, we made sure that we got third party certification from Leaping Bunny. I don't know if you know Leaping Bunny, but they are a, a global organization that certifies cruelty free supply chains. And so all of our suppliers that we work with are certified with Leaping Bunny. And as a result, our company is certified with Leaping Bunny. The Intern Whisperer is brought to you by Cat5 Studios, who help you create games and videos for your training and marketing needs that are out of this world. Visit Cat5 Studios for more information to learn how Cat5 Studios can help your business. Thank you, Cat5 Studios.